I'm indifferent I'm believing God to the existence of God is not judging them I don't have proof I don't know how to pray they're judging themselves you know where is God in all of this this is my home God exists what does it say about God that he created the orgasm I don't pledge allegiance to anything I don't pray only to God if there was a God and I thought I just have this understanding that life is hard he could never love me after this God is still good Hello and welcome to the Maybe God podcast. I'm Justin Briley, guest hosting this edition of the show. And this show inspires doubtful believers and hopeful sceptics to seek answers to their most challenging faith questions through uplifting and powerful storytelling. Well, today I'm speaking with a storyteller and mythologist, Martin Shaw, who in the last couple of years has his own quite extraordinary story to tell. After many years as a poet, author and teaching others through the West Country School of Myth, Martin had an encounter encounter with Christ that well confounded really a lot of his expectations he's going to tell us about that story he is now a christian but sees this homecoming if you will as a fulfillment of a life invested in mythology and storytelling already so i'm looking forward to hearing martin's story i'm sure you will too uh, martin welcome along to the show thank you justin nice to see you tell us what a mythologist and storyteller is first of all <laughs> well they're two slightly different disciplines A storyteller is exactly what you would imagine. It's the thing that we've been doing since the Lascaux Caves. It's looking around at consciousness, looking around at the world we're living in and making sense of it to some degree through stories. A mythologist uh, has the ring of academia about it, I suppose. Uh, A mythologist is someone that explores the layers of a story from its kind of, you know, metaphysical wow factor down to you know does this does this story feel like it happened to you on the way to work this morning because actually to be honest if a story doesn't have some kind of uh, resonance in the life we're actually living they don't get remembered for long so tell us about how that's looked in your own life when it comes to your engagement with that is that something that was there from early on this sense of wanting to explore mythology, folklore, stories, and so on? Yes, and I think probably not having a telly was a great contributor to that, because if I, if I could have got my hands on the television more regularly, I don't think that I would have spent as much time in the woods as I did. I don't think I would have spent a much, as much time reading books and listening to stories and being around it. But I'd had an experience where I'd been walking with my dad early one morning, and he'd recited a poem And as he recited it, the sun came up. Now, in my five-year-old mind, this was an extraordinary act of sympathetic magic. My dad had done that. (laughs) Certain words, beautifully expressed, bumped into everything around us and caused a reaction. Mm. And I used to see the same thing when my mum was reading me a story at night. I'd see the moon come out, and in my little associative mind, I thought there was a relationship, and I think there probably still was, between the movement of the moon and the words of my mum. So that was the way it expressed itself when you were growing up. Did did you find yourself drawn in, you know, as you, you know, began reading for yourself to sort of storytelling, fantasy literature? What was your own engagement with with the stories that people tell? Well, I... I, I didn't know that storytellers existed in the se- in in the fashion that I am one today, but there were well-meaning ladies in libraries that would read you a story. But there's a difference between being read a story and being told a story. There's a difference between a recital and an imagining, and it was the imagining that I was excited about. I went to I went to a church uh, called Upton Vale Baptist Church in Torquay in the mid seventies. And I remember often, you know, I would have been whisked off to uh, Sunday school, but there was a day where I remember somehow I was trapped in the adult sermon. And I could (laughs) see that the sermon was of great, you know, substance for folks several generations older. But I had this fantasy that Aslan was going to burst through a window, grab the preacher by the scruff of the neck, not kill them, but just generally shake up the oxygen of the room. Uh, and so I, I was at the, the Christianity and the stories I was experiencing through Christianity, 
I think in reflection, Justin, there was a bit of a disconnect between mm. the kind of radical, actually countercultural message of Yeshua, of Jesus, this strange Galilee Druid, and the incredibly sort of domestic and rather urban and settled setting that had encrusted itself around this very strange uh, uh, Middle Eastern mystery religion. Mm, mm. So you were already, I suppose, at a young age, sort of were, were sensing something that, that what you were being showed in the church that you perhaps grew up in didn't feel like the the wild, untamed kind of story that, that you obviously already had a sense that Christianity might might be about. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did love the stories, I think. You know, I remember David and Goliath and things like that. But they, they didn't do to my soul what a fairy tale would do or a great mm. myth like the Odyssey. And Jesus himself was speaking of such a high bar, of such sort of... Uh, interior discipline <laughs> i knew i would be i would be terrible at that i used to describe christ as the first the first alien that ever visited earth you know because he seemed so unusual to me he didn't seem like the other gods that i encountered in stories so i think yeah it it did it seemed uh an urban well masticated well chewed mm. faith with a tremendous emphasis on belief but the trouble was when I was, you know, six, I didn't believe in anything for more than a few minutes. I didn't even <laughs> believe entirely that I was a boy. I thought I may be a hawk uh, or I, I, I was, you know, some goblin that lived in the forest. And so actually that kind of uh, evangelical pressure froze my artistic soul, to be honest. Mm. And another thing is that although I appreciate now actually the – the, the the you know Baptists can really deliver a good sermon. There's real content. It's fantastic. Mm. Now I pr I appreciate it now, but I was not aware of a contemplative tradition. I wasn't aware mm. of the saints really. I wasn't aware of wild old women living in the desert. I wasn't aware of of the first really the first three hundred years of Christianity, and the strangeness of that story. And yeah. for some reason, for me, although obviously. The traditional, um, a d traditional description of the church is the body of Christ. I used to look out the window and think, well, is a meadow of wildflowers the body of Christ? Is a mountain range the body of Christ? Is the bottom of the sea part of the body of Christ? What does creator actually think? Is Christianity allowed to exist in the wild places as well as the breathlessly human? Yes. So you were kind of experiencing this this disjunct between the sort of dis domesticated version, as it were, of Christianity and the, this sense that you had that there might be something else out there, something bigger and wilder. Um, I mean, you've already intimated that you did grow up that in that sense in a in a Christian setting. Um, but did that faith just kind of not stick for the kinds of reasons you've described? Did it sort of obviously you you, you had, you know, loving parents, as did. far as I understand, yeah, yeah. who wanted i'm sure to pass on the faith as best they could but for whatever reason it it doesn't qu didn't quite fit your personality and that artistic soul that you you describe you know wonderfully justin i'm realizing as you're saying this to me that my parents they did pass it on you know the message was received it just took just took half a century <laughs> <laughs> uh but yes at that time at that time it seemed tamed unromantic, um, uh, book laden, you know, I, it, again, you know, the people of the book, I, I, I wanted to look out. I knew, I knew I had a feeling for God, but mm. I knew that I needed to feel it in the, in the face of a flower or an animal or the movement of the weather or a dream. Now, of mm. course, there'll be many Christians rolling their eyes at this point and saying that's all in the Bible. But certain <laughs> parts of the Bible are highlighted more than others. Mm. And I just hadn't, that hadn't really sifted to consciousness. So actually, by the time I was 17, I remember my last day in church, actually, when I thought, no, I, I need to go walk about. And I remained on walk about for, I suppose, another uh, best part of 35 years. Yeah. 
What were the stories that were capturing your imagination then? What, who, you've mentioned a few, you know, the Odyssey and others. Where, where did you find that, that, that those sparks of joy were to be found? Well, funnily enough, uh, I found those sparks of joy initially from the very man that wanted me to be a Christian. It was my dad. <laughs> because once he'd been preaching and we were walking home, he'd say, well, you know, in this forest, you know, Morgana Le Fay is just behind a tree. And isn't this a little bit like the King Arthur stories? So... My, you know, my my heart was kind of wired romantically very early and without any effort whatsoever. It was just so natural. Mm. I swooned into it. I wasn't pressured into it. That's a good... Uh, I'm going to remember this. I swooned <laughs> into it. I wasn't pressured into it. It was a movement of the heart, not f- fear-laden. Mm. You know, fear, I, didn't, I didn't smell sulfur and that I was going to be chucked into... You know the 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 ninth rung of hell. Uh, so then I got older, and I realised that Irish stories, uh, stories of someone called Finn McCall, Russian fairy tales, they actually had tremendous complexity to them. And there's that the dichotomy that some Christians have, where all everything you could possibly need in terms of how to live exists within the Bible and everything outside is to be, be viewed with suspicion or potentially even luciferic. That was not the atmosphere that I mm. grew up in. Mm. I grew up in much more of the perspective of Augustine, which is, you know, all, all truth is God's truth. Yeah. And actually radiating through the strangest stories for many thousands of years before the advent of these 33 years that we have lived in the the shock of ever since, mm. there were all sorts of pinpricks of eternity. So to be honest, unconsciously, I started to gravitate towards the grace that was in all of these other stories. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, you're obviously an imaginative, artistic soul. I almost have this vision of you, Martin, as a sort of wild man of the woods, <laughs> kind of, you know, just exploring nature, inviting others into this journey. You've obviously had, though, uh, you know, you, you've, you've gone the academic route. You've done the PhD. You've, um, you've obviously established a school uh, of mythology and storytelling as well. What were you, have you been hoping to pass on in the decades that you've had that? And I know that there was one specifically very important encounter, I think, in Snowdonia where the mythic imagination really came to be central yes. to your life. Do you want to just t- talk talk us through that? Because I think that's important before we kind of get to mm. the the second, if you like, epiphany <laughs> in your journey. Yes, well, I had gone up at 23. I'd gone up to a mountain in Snowdon. Let's, 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 let's call it a big hill mm. uh, called Kata Idris. And around that area, I had fasted for four days and nights. And that... Although to some people listening, they'll think, well, what on earth is that? It's no great mystery that all around the world for thousands of years, certainly Christians included, it's often a very healthy thing for a period of time to get away from your job description, to get away from your family, to get away from all of that. Sit quietly on a hill till you locate the still small voice. I mean, you know, Jesus's relationship to towns are very, it's very interesting. He's always slipping out. Mm. <laughs> He's always slipping out early in the morning. That was one of the, re- I, was, I always noticed that these, these, you know how compressed the Bible is in its mm. language. So absolutely. Mm. Uh, but I always noticed that. So I, I went through a huge epiphany. I was a musician. I returned my record contract and then actually, lived in a tent for four years at the very end of the 1990s, just before there would have been a phone in my pocket or an email address. It was still Mm. time when you could actually disappear. So I lived in this black tent to to digest quite what had happened to me. Now, as you're talking to me, Justin, I'm thinking about something. I'm thinking about mystical experience and theoretical knowledge. And I think the reason why I went the way of a mythologist and I got a doctorate and the rest of it was because I needed I needed to comb through the encounter that I'd had in a language that was communicable to other people mm. because actually I was rendered speechless by it. And so that's I've been thinking about this recently, how God God places you in place 
positions to learn things long before you realize the big picture of why you're going through this. Mm. And so I was just led into mythology. I was led back into the stories of my youth to explain an ineffable uh, mystery that I'd entered up there in the woods. And then I trained in that work for eight years. And so now I have the full gamut of, on the one hand, leading wilderness fast, of which I'm about to lead my first Christian one uh, in mm. August, specifically for Christians, right the way through to postgraduate courses and people that are looking from a much more poetical or theoretical basis of mm. mind. And during this period of your life, how did you regard Christ as another myth among many? What was the sort of way in which you, you sort of thought about that? He's, he's definitely not, an, he's not a myth amongst many. Uh, and when I, when sort of, you know, I'm sorry to be, you know, when people's knowledge of mythology is primarily being plucked from YouTube, mm. when there isn't a great deal of how people can say with a kind of great wave of the hand, well, of course, you also have Osiris and you have Dionysus and all of this stuff. Speaking as someone that has a new version of the back eye coming out, Euripides' play on Dionysus, <laughs> very soon, I can tell you that those figures, although there's an ornamental connection through things like the vine and wine, you're never in a million years going to encounter something like the Sermon on the Mount coming out of mm. Dionysus' mouth. I found Christ disturbing. Um, there's a poet I know whose name I, I won't mention her, but you'd know who she was. But she said to me, she said, I think in a very strange way, Christ is the last of the Greek gods and mm. turns everything before sort of on its head. And of, of course, you know, just stating the obvious, of course, Jesus was a Jew, but I knew what she was getting at. I knew mm. what she was getting at. So actually I viewed, I viewed, I knew enough to know that the Christ story didn't fit neatly with any of the other mythologies that I was exploring, although there was connective thread. Mm. What disturbed me about the gospels was that it sounded awfully like they had a postcode to them. It, do you know what I'm saying? It, yes. It's very site-specific. You don't uh -huh. get this in the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels mm. were all floating around like astronauts, and it's the same old, same old. If you've read <laughs> mystical content, you've read that before. Okay. But the, the, the Gospels are gnarly and strange, and they're all happening in an area that you can walk around. You know, you can walk around mm. with a map. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that's that's a little bit too much like real life for me. I, I better stay away from it. <laughs> so real life came calling, though. Why don't you take us up to what happened a couple of years ago now? Um, because this is both, I guess, a spiritual, intellectual, experiential journey that you went on. Um, may, maybe take us, yeah, from wherever you want to in that story and, and, and how Christ presented himself in a very real way to you, Martin. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's go back. It's it now many years have passed. I'm at the end of my 40s. Uh, you know, providentially, I've ended up earning a living doing something I really love. I've been a I've been a tutor at Stanford. I've written, I think by then I'd written about 16 books. Uh, I just, you know, absolutely known in my world, absolutely known, as of my generation, the guy that's doing this particular type of work. But then I, I, had, a, I had an odd sensation, I don't know where it, let, where it came from, to spend 101 days visiting a local Dartmoor forest. Now, you can re remember, Justin, that I'm a veteran of sitting out in the bush. But the trouble is, if you do anything in life over and over and over again, there'll come a day when you get to the back of the wardrobe and it's just fur coats and, and the back of the wardrobe and the wilderness vigil, to some degree, I knew it so well, I needed to do something else to, to tripwire my own heart again, to tripwire my own imagination. And so I knew a 101 day vigil in the forest was going to do something that I hadn't encountered before. And so through the end of 2019, in the winter of 2020, I was visiting this forest every day, primarily to listen. Again, I know how um, that may sound very airy-fairy, but it's just part of my 
It's just how I am. I, I, I listen to woods because I'm aware that if you go into a forest of oak trees, for the last few hundred years, they've just had people looking at them as bits of two by four mm. and looking at them and thinking, well, you'll make a nice boat or a ship. <laughs> and so I wanted to go and actually tell stories back to a place. So lots of Dartmoor stories, lots of poems. And then, uh, and I don't want to over labor this because if I talk about this, what happens too much, it'll become a story. Yeah, and you know, you, can, you understand in yeah. a way it's so precious. What I can say is on the last night of the vigil, I went into the very center of the woods, which there was an old Iron Age fort. And I, I had a, a profound, uh, shatteringly beautiful encounter. Uh, now, I must emphasize that I hadn't been fasting at this point. I'd had, a, I'd had a meal. I was content between me and you. I was glad the thing was almost over. That, mm. was, that was the mood. The mood was thanks, bye-bye, glad it's done. But I, I just, in my own way, I prayed and I said, if there's anything, you know, and I would use the word like creator, you know, mm. the, if, if there's anything you, you really need me to see or absorb at this moment, please announce it. Please announce it. Uh, and what happened then was I was looking out at the night sky and I was looking at all, you know, we all know what stars look like. They're these beautiful pale lights. And then suddenly I, my eye caught one that was, it, it, it had a, a, a different set of colours to it. It was almost slightly like the aurora borealis. And I thought, oh, it's getting bigger. That's weird. It's getting bigger. And as I stood there in the forest, I realized, and this whole thing is 15 to 20 seconds. It's incredibly mm, quick. Mm. I realized that the thing is actually coming out of the sky and is going to land and, you know, not land like a, a UFO or not land like a, a big chunk of rock, but this strange, beautiful painted arrow, like a set of colors, just flew out of the darkness and landed about 10 foot away from me. Ironically, it landed exactly where I, I usually have my kitchen tent where I'm running <laughs> wilderness vigils. So these days, whenever I'm pasting sandwiches, I'm looking <laughs> over it, you know, where it happened. I don't know what it was. I could, you know, I, I, there's no problem for me in, on the one level, it could be a completely natural phenomena. But on the other, as we learn through the miraculous the conditions in which it occurs are significant. And the fact that I was up there after 101 mm -hmm. days, it was the end. I asked for a sign and I received something that I never could have anticipated. I must say, if you bear in mind what I'd been doing for the last 25 years, I've been a wilderness rites of passage guide. I've been living in my tent. I'd seen many strange things out in the woods, but, but nothing out of the sky. Mm. And what it did even then was it, I, it was like a distinction between the wonders of the earth and the wonders that come from the being that made the earth. Mm. That was the kind of jolt. And then when I, I, you know, I stood up there all night and it wasn't a frightening experience. It wasn't harrowing in any way, just baffling, beautiful. Mm. But then I came home. And then over a period of about, I didn't jump straight into the the Christian waters. I was in mm, denial, mm, really. Mm. I, I'd seen, believe it or not, and this is the end of the, the really mysterious bit of it, I'd seen as I was falling asleep these nine words, inhabit the time and genesis of your original home. Now, I didn't, I didn't like that because it said genesis. And I also didn't understand it. Time and genesis, what does that mean? But I, ironically, lockdown immediately begins. So mm. I have the best part of a year to chew on quite what had happened. And towards the end of that period, dreams came. And they were the kind of dreams that were just unavoidably powerful. And I started to dream of a figure that I couldn't quite see. I had a dream that I was in the trenches. It was like the First World War. And I was with clearly my captain but i couldn't see his face and he looked at my arm and he said you know 
you've done a good job trying to fix your arm, but it's in a terrible state. And I looked down and sure enough, my arm was like that. And he said, he said, look, you've been through something really difficult and I can fix your arm if you want, but I have to break it again. Hmm. Do you want this? Uh, and I looked at my captain. I still couldn't see his face properly, but I said, please fix it. And if it hurt, it only hurt for a second. But from that point onwards, a great flood of dreams started to come. And suddenly this figure that had been, I'd kept at bay academically, I'd kept it mm -hmm. at bay theoretically, was suddenly nearer to me than my own heart. And by that time, you've had it. I mean, you've absolutely had it. You would be at full foolishness in the middle of your life to deny, you know, the depth of the invitation that was being offered. But as you understand, Justin, as I'm talking to you, now, I, I know how, to some people, how nutty this will sound. Mm. But this is how, this is partially how God works, I think. I tell you what, I mean, the, the, the phrase from Acts 2, um, your, your young men will dream dreams, your old men will see visions. I'm not saying you fall into necessarily either camp, Martin, but the, <laughs> the point is there's an expectation, isn't there, that, that somehow visionary experiences, dreams are part of the way God communicates. Now, obviously, we live in a very rationalistic culture in the West where people are inclined to say, well, it's just you know, the cheese you had last night or some sort of internal bias, you know, um, and, you know, you're, you're going to interpret things the way you want to. But for you, I think it's harder to deny that when you're the one experiencing that, because there's something about the power that comes with that, 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 that if you're in the midst of it is actually difficult to sort of simply say, no, that was just my imagination. That was just, you know, a neurobiological phenomenon. That That sounds to me like, the sort of experience you're having there, Martin. I, yes, and I also feel that to some degree, one doesn't necessarily cancel out the other. Mm. You know what I mean? All of that can be true at the same time. Mm. Uh, and you're going to be, it'll be what you do with it. Do you curate it? Do you look after it? Do you, do you protect that experience and watch it grow? Or do you put it on the shelf, mark strange spiritual experiences? Mm. And I elected not to do that. But I do think that I had been prepared for about 25 years for that encounter. The right relationship to nature was established. The degree of reading in which I could probably interpret something like that. But no amount of book smarts makes something like that happen. There's mm. no amount of theoretical knowledge that can pull a light out of the sky. Um, yeah, so yeah. so I've you know you 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 are aware that on one hand you're going to be you know a laughing stock you'll you'll lose credibility in all sorts of ways and of course that's to, to a degree that happened, but the as far the last time I checked, you know Jesus wasn't standing around saying come with me everything's going to be easy, uh, and there'll be an insurance policy. He says come find out that I knew that mm. I knew, yeah, and so that in a way seemed like the pearl of great price yeah you know so the phrase that you went to bed that came to your mind inhabit the time and genesis of your original home was yeah. it? yeah um did you connect that then with your christian upbringing was that the sense oh, that, yeah. that, 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 that you were being drawn back to yeah. that story that you'd sort of put aside as as something too domesticated and tame yeah. and yet was coming back in a new way at this phase in your life in in the end, it wasn't the Baptist church, though, that you found your your Christian home in. Do you want to tell us about sort of where you have found that, that spiritual home? I will. I will. Uh, so, you know, just to finish, really, I, I came out of the woods. I'd gone mm. in for 101 days, expected to become, I would say, wedded to the wild. Mm. And I came out wedded to Christ. And what happened over the next year was I realized both of these realities faced each other. They faced each other. You know, I've called it the mossy face of Christ. So then what happens is I knew it would not be... A, I, I, I felt and I feel that by and large Christians do really need to find a church. You need to find your, your room in the many mansions, in the many mansioned place. And so I looked around and in the end actually 
I met a lot of a lot of Christians with great hearts, and I learned to recognize Christians uh, instinctively. Uh, there's a feeling about them. I, I call them worker bees. And I know that's a big part of what's going on in my own life is between me and you, I, I've been I've had a fairly highfalutin conversion. It's been mm. quite public. I've met mm. all sorts of folks that are really at the cutting edge of many interesting things. But make no mistake, Christ, where the rubber meets the road with Christianity, as far as I can tell, is down in the granular detail of how I relate to other people. It's yeah. am I really am I really showing up or not? Or am I just, you know, on the surface of things? So in other words, it was kind of important that I didn't leave everything open to my own interpretation 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. because that's not that's not healthy for me. Yeah. That's not healthy. So obviously, I I then ended up in a place where no one in my family really knew much about, which is Eastern Orthodoxy. I went into a church uh, just as they were uh, beginning something called Divine Liturgy, and I suddenly located all the missing elements that had been uh, seemingly not present in the Christianity of my youth. Now, uh, and I think we've talked about this before, you and I, a big thing in my family's evolution was the charismatic movement. Mm. And the charismatic movement was was big news in the 70s and the 80s and before and after. And it, 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 it had always touched me. It had always mm. touched me. Um, but when I went into the divine liturgy, I realized it was like a taste in my mouth. I thought, oh, that that presence is here again. This Holy Spirit is here. But this time through the decorum and the formality of the divine liturgy, it has this incredible runway into mm. the room. Mm. Uh, it's not quite as dramatic round the sides. <laughs> People are kind of falling off their chairs in the way I was used to it and enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. But the the voltage, the voltage was the same. So I had it was a I've often said in my my work, wildness is the dance partner of discipline. Wildness is that you need certain choreographed steps. And for me, orthodoxy provides that. It's bigger than me. It's far older than me. It's very mm. substantial. Much of it I struggle with. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm aware that I am I'm really up against something of tremendous substance. Um, so for the next year I spent just showing up at church. No one would have a clue or interest in what mm. I do outside of church. None. Mm. That's, that's humbling. Yeah. You know, that's humbling. You're just there doing, mm. the, doing mm. the kettles, doing the tea and yeah. the rest of mm. it. And then uh, I've just been on an enormous tour. But just before I set off on that tour, I was received in. I'd already been baptized, mm. but I was received into the Orthodox Church. And that's where I find myself now. Such an interesting journey you've taken there. There's something I suspect about the nature of the Orthodox Church. It's, I, I suppose, the fact that it does major on the kind of the imminence of God. Uh, it isn't so concerned, perhaps, with that sort of analytical sort of side. In, it, I'm sure it has its analytical side, but but that 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 maybe comes through in the Protestant tradition, in the Reformed traditions, the Baptists, and so on. Uh, and obviously, the fact is very ancient. It goes right back, really, to the genesis of the Church. Um, I guess stepping into an ancient imaginative stream kind of suits you, your, 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 the, the way your mind and soul works, Martin? I think it, I think it does. Uh, I, I'm having to come to terms with, for example, when we read from the Bible, it's chanted. It's not mm. really read in the way right. that the, the post-Reformation Christians are familiar with. And I like reading the Bible you know, in my own voice, with my own twists sure. and turns. And that doesn't roll in orthodoxy, and it's not going to roll in orthodoxy, because with orthodoxy, the clue is in the name. Yes. <laughs> the clue is in the name. Uh, I have a joke. How many, how, many, uh, how many orthodox Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? <laughs> Probably no change. Uh, so, yes, sometimes it's difficult because yeah. I have a kind of improvisational spirit. I do. Mm. Um, mm. 
But the liturgy itself, interesting things to note about it, effectively it's a sung theology. So mm. we're singing rather than reading, or if we are reading, we're chanting. The, the liturgy itself is a very, very slow form of dance that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And you do feel that you've moved from... Uh, here's a, it, this will sound a rather highfalutin analogy, but it's worth making because we have the time to do it. Mm. In poetry, there's many types of poetry, but there's one type called lyric and there's one type called epic. I grew up with lyric Christianity, not epic. Mm. Now, what mm. that means is lyric poems have a lot of I in. They have a lot of back rub in. They have a lot of I feel this. He's in my heart. Jesus is my friend. He's here. I'm tired. Please look after me. That kind of thing. It's very personable, mm. and I like it. But epic poetry pays far less attention to the I statement and lifts you out of that completely into this much bigger drama. It, classicism is, is epic poetry. And I think what I found in orthodoxy is the little I entered the big we at that mm. moment. And that's just something about the West in general that yeah. I'm exhausted by, you know, mm. the kind of uh, addiction to the confessional almost. Yeah. Uh, so actually for me... It, it, it regulates my ego. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in orthodoxy is a real distinction between they, what they call passion and virtue. And the world we live in these days is pretty good at passion, you know, pretty good at desire. But virtue, to make a covenant with limit, to mm. understand what that looks like, those are the kind of things that I'm going through with orthodoxy. To, to distill it, finally, one more thing is... Although I may look like a, a reasonable human being, I'm actually really a 12th century chivalric knight. I always <laughs> have been. And orthodoxy is a code. It's a way of behaving in the world. You can yeah. draw it with a line. Mm. It's mm. not massively ambiguous all the time, but mm. there are areas where they just say it is a mystery. Yeah. And I like yeah. that. Yeah. It's there's that combination. I was going to say that, that picture you paint of the, the epic versus lyric poetry, I think even within some Western Protestant traditions, people are starting to key into the fact that some of that kind of very individualistic versions of Christianity, where it's me, Jesus, and, you know, me getting to heaven and so on. I think thinkers like N.T. Wright and others have, have helped to actually say, no, you're actually part of an epic thing, this big story of God, this big movement. And... And it's so helpful, I think, sometimes to be reminded that it doesn't revolve around us. It revolves around God and the story God is painting. And it helps to put often our disappointments and failures into perspective as well, I find, because if, if the story isn't all about me, then that makes sense of the fact that I'm not always going to feel like I'm at the centre of this story. You know. I know. You know, as you were talking, Justin, I was thinking about Genesis and I was thinking about this image of us as creatures of mud and holy breath. Mm. And I think that as Christians, we run the risk of forgetting that, uh, that actually we're this, I, I think the, the mud, the holy breath, that's the part of us that is wired for Christian mythology. Mm. And the more culturally we take our cues from a society that has active hostility to us and has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus, um, I think we have to be careful. Like you, I'm sure, I'm a great fan of Tom Holland's book, Dominion. Mm. However, I think whilst it is true that, yes, on a secular level, Christianity and many good things exist in the West because of a kind of, um, a, you know, a Christian a, you know, a Christian influence, mm. I think it would be a foolishness to believe that as a culture that we are essentially Christian at this point. I don't think that. And you know as well as I do that Christ is always talking about cleaning the inside of the cup. Mm. We're not doing that. We're cleaning the outside of the cup, you mm -hmm. know, civic duty. Mm -hmm. But if we keep neglecting the inside of the cup, then I think Christianity in its most fundamental form uh, is in real jeopardy yeah i want to come back to talking about that and others who've had similar journeys to you in recent years as well 
before we get to that, let's go back to someone who's sort of been mentioned indirectly a couple of times in this conversation. You mentioned Aslan, that idea you had of him bursting through the the windows oh, yeah. of the Baptist church. And then you even referenced, you know, the, the wardrobe and the fur coats uh, and so on. So Lewis obviously has, I presume, had some influence on your thinking and, <laughs> you know, your imagination over the years. It, it's very striking to me that Lewis had a perhaps not dissimilar conversion experience himself when he, you know, grew, yeah, he was an expert in ancient mythology, literature, he found uh, just an enormous depth of meaning and joy in reading those stories. And yet he was also a very rational, intellectual person. And when he did go, well, he sort of had, a, as you I'm sure know, Martin, a sort of two-stage conversion. Firstly, from atheism to theism, he sort of just became convinced at an intellectual level, there must be a sort of moral lawgiver in the universe. But his conversion to Christianity, obviously, was was immensely helped by his friendship with J.R.R. R. Tolkien. And they had this famous walk around Addison Walk, uh, at the back of Magdalen College, where Tolkien apparently helped Lewis to see that Jesus may be regarded as the true myth, that all those other myths that so captured Lewis's imagination actually pointed towards something that really happened. I, I, I wondered whether that sort of was in any way analogous to your experience, uh, given your own background in mythology and so on. Yes, of course. I mean, that's, it's, uh, as, as they would say, it's a no brainer, really, uh, <laughs> in, in the sense that Tolkien, Lewis, Chesterton, Barfield, Charles Williams, others, there is a very real dynamic English Christian mythopoetic tradition that goes way back into the last century mm -hmm. and beyond. And so, yes, of course, I related to that. Um, I mentioned this earlier on with the Gospels. Something happens there where you find the promise of many myths all over the world arriving uncomfortably and dramatically in extraordinary form uh you know in this 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 area for 33 years and then out and so yeah i do of course i relate to lewis i've been thinking recently actually that it's the fate of any christian writer that working today that at some point you'll have an idea and then you will realize that lewis had that idea and expressed it better about 80 years ago. <laughs> so let me give you my idea. Go on. My idea, and I'll take this to Greenbelt, actually. I'm going to be at Greenbelt mm. in a few weeks' time. I think Christianity is in danger of forgetting that it's a dream. It's in danger of forgetting it's a dream. Now, what on earth do I mean by that? To understand in a way that would probably stabilise a Christian listening to this, go back and read Lewis's uh, A Pilgrim's Regress, which my, my dad prompted me to read a few months ago. And towards the end of it, Lewis, through the characters, makes a point where he says, Mother Kirk, which is his word for the church, is a combination of two things. It's what he calls the big pictures of the pagans combined with the road of the Jewish people. Mm. And when you have a road under your feet, something happens. But it is the nature, it is the nature of Mother Kirk that every few hundred years she starts to crumble and she grows into crisis. And at that point, the landlord starts to secrete the big pictures into people's hearts and minds again. Mm. And I really believe, and I would call it big dreams, this is a big dream moment and something is actually happening. It's, it's absolutely unarguable in my own life. And so there's a lot of us looking around and saying, yeah, this is a moment both of tremendous adversity, but incredible possibility. Now, Justin, every single myth I've ever told begins when you are outnumbered and outgunned. Nothing happens until you're at that moment. So this is an incredible time to be born into. But that would be my point is that Christians are great at vision, you know, mobilize. Mm -hmm. But the the dreaming underneath that, that ferment that is not just worked out in the daylight, you know, we need nighttime Christians as well as daytime Christians. That's an Aboriginal indigenous idea. And I think it's a very good one. 
And the, the early desert sisters and mothers and desert fathers, they understood that. You go out, sit quietly, and listen to what God is, is trying to communicate through you. And sometimes that comes through these stages. And I think that to go back, I think as Christians, we need to remember we're made of mud and holy wind. And I think that that, that kind of, that part of us, that, kind, that part of our actual consciousness and our mind is being on something of a starvation diet yeah. uh, in the West. Because to some extent the church has sort of, I suppose, adopted the empirical enlightenment kind of values of the general culture and and sort of transposed that all into a Christian key and potentially forgotten that that actually, as you say, Christianity was a dream. It was it was a, it was birthed in a kind of imaginative sort of sense of, of what God is and who what God can do. I mean, that's that's fascinating to me and, and interesting that you feel like we may be standing on the edge of as we see the crumbling of perhaps one form of church happening. And, you know, we could list all kinds of issues going on in the, the global church as we speak. But there's that hopeful note you sound that perhaps yes. this is what has to happen for 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 a new move of the spirit, essentially, yeah. um, a, a, in our day. Where are you seeing it happening? I, I, I'm aware, for instance, uh, one connection I've made is someone you know very well, Paul Kingsnorth, has a very similar story to you. He's also a sort of a sort of imaginative soul, a poet, an author, and who's interestingly also gone on a journey, quite unexpected journey to, to Eastern Orthodoxy as well. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the connection yeah. there and perhaps who else you're meeting yeah. as, you, as you make your journeys these days? Well, you know, Justin, only two weeks ago, I was with John, I was with uh, Paul Kingsnorth and a, a man called Jonathan Peugeot uh, yes. in Dublin. And we had, you know, we had, a, we had the Vatican reporter for CNN turned up. We had, uh, you know, all, all sorts of folks. The actor uh, uh, Ju uh, Jerome Flynn. Do you remember Robson mm. and Jerome? From mm. the oh, he yes, was the there and, and right. all sorts of folks were coming and no one quite knew why they were there. There was just <laughs> this bubble of excitement. Rod Dreyer suddenly it turns yes. up with a puff of smoke in the room and Rod's there <laughs> and this is there and there's all these Domin Dominican monks at the back. It was absolutely wonderful. And whilst there was no mission statement read, mercifully mm. and there was a kind of good-natured chaos about the event there was a sense of people wanting to think symbolically mythically in a storified fashion in a contemplative fashion about the greatest story ever told mm. uh, and i don't think in all honesty at the moment at least it's not necessarily about you know, some radical new slant that no one's ever thought of mm. before, because they probably have. Mm. But I do think we need a new vocabulary. I think we, I think words matter. How you tell stories matter. And I think we've taken, to some degree, a really wrong turn. You know, mm. we have, we've derobed ourselves of the weird so effectively uh, that um, people think they can draw Christians with one line now. And that's a dreadful thing. So let me think. Uh, yeah, there's Jonathan Peugeot, Rod Dreyer, Catherine Bennett is a friend of mine. Mm. There's a great artist, Vespa Stamper, who I'm working with at the moment over in Canada, Elizabeth Oldfield, Nicholas Qatar. These are all people to check out. Mm. And what I would say is they are, you know, they're artists, thinkers, uh, Paul, of course, uh, Kings North, who are just sort of gather who are just finding each other at this moment mm. in time. And can you imagine for me how thrilling it is, how yeah. absolutely surprising it is to have, have made the step of realising I was a dreadful form of Christian, because that's actually what happened. <laughs> <laughs> of all sinners, I am the first. Uh, but then being around all of this wonderful, uh, these wonderful conversations. And I think actually to to mention someone that many of, uh, many of, the, the watchers would probably know is is Bishop Barron. Mm, you know, Bishop Robert it's really Barron. worth mm. what, watch, ro watching Robert Barron talk about philosophy, picking his way through Jungian mythology or something like that, and not immediately trying to ward it off as an aberration. That's mm. very healthy. And I mm. also want to give you know you're doing something similar. You know you're you're plonking yourself endlessly in the most diverse of situations to see what happens. 
Mm. God bless you. Keep well, doing it. <laughs> thank you. I mean, and I would say, you know, a lot of the names you've mentioned obviously have are or have been on a journey to Christian faith. I, I interestingly see, you know, in my conversations, all kinds of interesting people who, who wouldn't necessarily wear that label, but who seem to be somewhere sympathetic to or have at least turned away from a more atheist materialist sort of perspective on reality and, and are kind of re-engaging the imagination and what they would, how they would like the world to be almost. Uh, and I'm thinking of obvious characters like Jordan Peterson, who, you know, is, again, one of these big, big platform people asking questions in this sort of area about the symbolic and faith and religion and so on. Um, you've already mentioned Tom Holland, who's, I think, done an amazing service in kind of just pointing out the fact that we we live in essentially many of our deepest instincts are Christian. They're theological in nature and that we can't just assume that, you know, we inherited all this from some sort of enlightenment rationality. Um, and likewise, you know, there are there are other people. I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with um, Ian McGilchrist, uh, the neuroscientist and psychiatrist, again, who's just, I think, fascinatingly taking the scientific stuff and and melding it somehow with a sense of, well, who are we and what is this life about? And and are we just thinking machines set to kind of propagate our DNA or or is there a bigger picture? Is there something that these brains are pointing to? that is actually about the imagination, something holistic. He's he's obviously done this amazing work in pointing out the fact that we're meant to, you know, be controlled really by the right brain, but we live in this left brain culture where everything just gets broken down into tiny da pieces of data that we think can explain everything. So I, I feel like there's something bigger foot, Martin. I don't know if that's your sense as well. It is, it is. And I think you're right to distinguish the fact that it's, peop it's, it's you know, outliers. It's not necessarily dyed-in-the-wall Christians mm. that experiencing. Someone else who's going through, you know, a very deep public conversation around faith is Nick Cave. Yes. There's no one, no one in modern <laughs> music more credible than him, other than maybe mm. Dylan. <laughs> uh, he, he, it's extraordinary these conversations he's had with Rowan Williams and others. Um, I agree. The God-shaped hole, the meaning-shaped hole, for me, the myth-shaped hole is not going to go away. An interesting little development is that as the as the father of a teenage daughter, as a as the the father of a little digital native. Mm. For the first time, I'm noticing more ambivalence for young people around technology mm. than the ones that are slightly older. Right. It's as if they are, are they're so used to it now, they can actually identify, rather than being this sort of horrific idea that we're getting sort of brought endlessly into the sort of the frame of a computer where we're sort of AI beings, they seem still to have discernment. They still seem to have a sense of things of va things that value and matter that you can't find on a screen. So that's a mm. hopeful thing. Mm. And you're right. I mean, McGilchrist is extraordinary, really, what he's doing. Uh, I would hope, actually, we've talked about it, you know, you're hearing it here first, but fingers crossed myself, McGilchrist and Kingsnorth will do something together. Great. I hope that mm. comes to pass. Yeah. Well, all I can say is that, you know, um, Kings North needs to start growing a beard to compete with you guys. He has you know, a beard. Well, he does actually. Yes, you're right. But I, I still feel it could do with you know, developing well, a beard, little bit more. You, you may notice I'm looking a little trimmed since we last met, because actually <laughs> I've I've just been on this enormous tour and it was so hot that I thought I, it's one way or other. You're either going to rock the Mount Athos look, or you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna have to have a trim for now because you're just dying of the heat. Uh, so yeah, King Paul Paul has a kind of school teacher beard. Yes, that's and he, right. Yeah, he could he could he could let his yeah, freak could, flag fly. Definitely, a bit. I I think if you're going Eastern Orthodox, you might as well go the whole hog. You know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, th this has been such a fun, interesting conversation. I mean, you've obviously made all these new connections and exciting sort of you know collaborations and partnerships and and dreaming dreams, I suppose, with some of these folk. What I, I'd just love to explore briefly. What was the negative reception to this? You kind of briefly alluded to that earlier, Martin. I'm guessing there were some people who thought, oh, my goodness, Martin, you've been taken in. You know, it's, Christianity, it's so conventional. It's so tame. It's so domesticated. We thought more of you. Than yes, this. yes. That, I mean, that absolutely was the message from certain corners. Not all, not all, but, but there was... 
um there was some pushback from my first nations friends you know mm -hmm. uh, in different tribal groups who i've loved and been in great fellowship with over the last 30 years that was heartbreaking to me mm. um there was the sense that i'd immediately become a kind of uh, woman hating nature hating uh you know uh, patriarchal character of course <laughs> i'm now part of a, a orthodoxy we're quite into the patriarchs yeah so, uh, sure. <laughs> that's something to chew on but um yeah there there, there was pushback there was financial consequences you know, uh, there mm. were books not selling. There was uh, a few premises for books that never went anywhere. Uh, I have to say the winds has cer have certainly changed. Right. They've certainly That's changed. But I did a long tour. I've been on the road since April, and I only finished on Friday, uh, where I went across Canada, uh, Wales, Ireland, England, the Mediterranean. I met thousands of people. And it is, it's the question no one can bear asking. So after a while, so, you know, one hand will come up <laughs> at the very back and they say, is it true you're a God botherer? <laughs> is it true you're a God botherer? And then we, we, we pick it from there. But between me and you, the ripples, the, you know, not just, of course, in my own small story, but the ripples of what happens when someone you trust mm. and you know isn't crazy mm. makes that kind of step. It sets up all kinds of other conversations, it, and that is what I'm in the middle of. And, and that's what I love about talking to people like you. You, you haven't, you're not someone who, as it were, is known for being a Christian in the past. Likewise, Paul Kingsnorth, likewise Nick Cave. You know, there's there's a credibility that comes with someone who's already got established an audience uh, because of something they've done that has brought value and meaning and purpose and you know to people's lives and then suddenly they start talking in terms of god and christianity i think sometimes that's the only way that you if it comes from you know the usual places then people kind of tune it out and 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 i, I i'm excited by the fact that that you and other folks are kind of have got something to say and an audience that I think are suddenly open to hearing it perhaps for the first time in a long time. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, yeah. Well, um, God bless you, Martin. It's been thank so you. interesting to hear, hear of your, your journey. Um, and I hope we can catch up again at some point in the future, but all the very best as you continue, you know, exploring what may be and any sort of, um, particular projects that you would like to let people know about at this point, ways in which they can continue to engage with your story and the work that you're doing? Most importantly, subscribe to my Substack because Good. that is something where every Sunday, if you don't go to church at nine <laughs> o'clock every morning, every Sunday, you're going to get a little, you know, I call it the, uh, the parish, you know, House of Beasts and Vines, where my own Christian explorations are moving along. You know, to, we've, he's, he's, you know, of course, he's the patron saint of this conversation. Do you remember Lewis said that he said, Christ is the sun from which I see everything else? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm taking that to heart. And I'm not convinced at the moment that necessarily I have anything terribly shattering to say about the Bible itself that hasn't already been combed through. But, but as a Christian now, the way I see life in general, the way I see the fairy tales and the myths, I see all of these implications that I that would have been hidden from me three years ago. So I think that'll be some part of the work. Uh, I am writing a big book at the moment. It was amazing after slightly being in the wilderness with publishers. Uh, mm. One that you would have all know about came along and said, actually, we're going to get behind you and support you. So it's right. wonderful. But Substack, Martin Shaw, House of Beasts and Vines, that's the place to go. I'll be at Greenbelt in about a month. Um, and I'm, I'm a, what's wonderful is across the gamut, I'm meeting Christians from all sort of political persuasions, and I can't be, I can't be compartmentalized into any mm. of them. Uh, but across the board, something is afoot. Uh, and for that, I'm just grateful to be part of it. Well, thank you for taking some time to talk me through your journey, Martin. Uh, we will make sure there are links to your website, your Substack, and so on from today's show. But for now, God bless you and see you next thank time. Thank you.